What's up everyone? Today we have a very exciting lesson for you where we'll be learning English with the first book from The Hunger Games by Suzanne Collins. But before we get into it, and in case you're new here, I want to let you know that we help you to learn fast English without getting lost, without missing the jokes, and without subtitles. Just like this fan who says that our channel is the bomb. So be sure to hit that subscribe button and the bell down below so that you don't miss any of our new lessons. So just to let you know, in case you haven't yet read the book or seen the movies, there are no spoilers in this lesson. So don't worry, you can keep watching. And if you do want to read along with me, I'm going to be reading from page four. So you can read along with me with the passage if you have the book as well. But before we start reading, we're going to learn a little bit more about the fictional world in which The Hunger Games is set, as well as some vocabulary from the passage that I'm going to be reading as a little bit of prep work. Are you ready? So first, let's take a look at where and in what time the novel unfolds. The Hunger Games is a novel that unfolds in Panem, an apocalyptic world sometime in the future. Geographically, Panem is located in North America, but characters in the story mention large areas of land across the world that have become uninhabitable due to rising sea levels. So who is the main character? This story centers around a 16-year-old girl called Katniss Everdeen and her struggle to survive in dystopia. Panem is an oppressed world that runs in a way that resembles ancient Rome. There are 12 numbered districts, so you'll often hear references to District 2, District 3, and so on. Our main character, Katniss, is from District 12. There's also a capital city called the Capital, which is located in the Rocky Mountains. Some decades before the start of this novel, District 13 led an unsuccessful rebellion against the Capital, so District 13 was exterminated. To punish that incident and stop it from happening again, the Capital created Reaping Day. So once a year, the 12 districts are forced to offer a boy and a girl between the age of 12 and 18 to participate in the Hunger games. These games are a televised event in which these young boys and girls fight to the death. Dystopia is not a word that's in the passage that I'm about to read, but it describes the fictional world of the Hunger Games. Dystopia means the opposite of utopia, a very bad or unfair society in which there is a lot of suffering, especially an imaginary society in the future, after something terrible has happened. Reaping literally means to cut and collect your crops. We often say this when you get something good out of a result that you have done. For example, to reap the rewards of hard work. However, here it means the collection or the gathering of these young boys and girls from each district to participate in the games. Chain link fence topped with barbed wire loops. Chain link fences, as you can see in the picture, are what delimit the boundaries or borders of each district. They're topped, meaning they have on top barbed wire loops, as you can also see in the picture. Deterrent to, something that makes someone less likely to do something by making them realize it will be difficult or have bad results. In which of these sentences do you think this word isn't used correctly? Before we read the passage, we're going to look at five verbs and five definitions that you can try to match. To walk with no clear direction. That's right, this answer is Rome. To go onto someone's private land without their permission. The answer is trespassing. To find something and bring it back. That's right, the answer's retrieve. To hide something carefully. This answer is conceal. To make something using a special skill, especially with your hands. 
That's right, this answer is craft. Our part of District 12, nicknamed The Seam, is usually crawling with coal miners heading out to the morning shift at this hour. Men and women with hunched shoulders, swollen knuckles, many who have long since stopped trying to scrub the coal dust out of their broken nails, the lines of their sunken faces. But today, the black cinder streets are empty. Shutters on the squat grey houses are closed. The reaping isn't until two. May as well sleep in, if you can. If you sleep in, you let yourself sleep later than usual in the morning. If you want to have the ability to read more books as well as understand your favourite TV series and movies, then I highly recommend our Fluent with Friends course. You'll have a lot of fun learning with the first two seasons of Friends, receiving our PDF power lessons, vocabulary memorization software, and you'll also have access to our Fluency Circle global community. But the best part is you can try it right now for free with our three-part masterclass. All you have to do is click up here or down in the description box below to learn more and sign up now. Our house is almost at the edge of the scene. I only have to pass a few gates to reach the scruffy field called the meadow. Separating the meadow from the woods, in fact enclosing all of District 12, is a high chain link fence topped with barbed wire loops. In theory, it's supposed to be electrified 24 hours a day as a deterrent to the predators that live in the woods. Packs of wild dogs, lone cougars, bears that used to threaten our streets. But since we're lucky to get two or three hours of electricity in the evenings, it's usually safe to touch. Even so, I always take a moment to listen carefully for the hum that means the fence is live. Right now, it's silent as a stone. Concealed by a lump of bushes, I flatten out on my belly and slide under the two foot stretch that's been loose for years. There are several other weak spots in the fence, but this one is so close to home, I almost always enter the woods here. What do you think she means by a stretch that's been loose for years? Here she's talking about the fence. She's talking about a hole or a gap in the wired fence. She says, I flatten out my belly and slide under a two foot stretch that's been loose for years. Now, what she means by this is that she flattens out her belly as much as possible. So she's not hunched over, but she flattens it out and she slides under to get through. As soon as I'm in the trees, I retrieve a bow and sheath of arrows from a hollow log. Electrified or not, the fence has been successful at keeping the flesh eaters out of District 12. Inside the woods, they roam freely, and there are added concerns like venomous snakes, rabid animals, and no real paths to follow. But there's also food if you know how to find it. My father knew, and he taught me some before he was blown to bits in a mine explosion. There was nothing even to bury. I was 11 then. Five years later, I still wake up screaming for him to run. Now, peacekeepers are controlled by the capital and they are basically the military and law enforcement in Panem. The peacekeepers ensure that the law of the capital are obeyed and publicly punish anyone who breaks them. If you're a fan of The Hunger Games or even Jennifer Lawrence and absolutely love the movie, then I highly recommend you check out this lesson we made by clicking up here or down in the description box below to watch it next. Even though trespassing in the woods is illegal and poaching carries the severest of penalties, more people would risk it if they had weapons. But most are not bold enough to venture out with just a knife. My bow is a rarity, crafted by my father along with a few others that I keep well hidden in the woods, carefully wrapped in waterproof covers. My father could have made good money selling them, but if the officials found out, he would have been publicly executed for inciting a rebellion. Most of the peacekeepers turn a blind eye to the few of us who hunt because they're as hungry for fresh meat as anybody is. In fact, they're among our best customers. 
but the idea that someone might be arming the scene would never have been allowed. Katniss says that poaching carries the severest of penalties. This means the worst possible penalty. Penalty is an official punishment by law and in this world it could very well mean punished by death. She also says publicly executed for inciting a rebellion. Now, if you incite someone, it means that you motivate them to do something. It kind of has a negative connotation because you incite people to do something negative, whereas you motivate people to do something positive. As I mentioned at the beginning, a rebellion is what District 13 decided to do and failed at. The people from this district got together to fight the system. They basically rebelled. That's what a rebellion is, when lots of people come together and rebel against a system. If you turn a blind eye to something bad or illegal that is happening, you're basically not taking much notice of it on purpose so that you don't have to deal with it. Now, let's check your comprehension of the text with a few questions. I hope you enjoyed reading this passage from The Hunger Games with me and if you would like another lesson on it, maybe as the story develops, let me know down in the comments below. Or if you'd like a lesson with another book, please do let me know again down in the comments because I'd love to make one that is highly requested and popular. But now it's time to go beyond the classroom and live your English. Ah, yeah! We'll be learning with Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, the first book in the series by J.K. Rowling. And in the first part of today's lesson, I'm going to be reading a few of the pages. And then in the second part, I'm going to teach you the trickiest pieces of vocabulary. So I recommend you grab yourself a cup of tea, coffee or hot chocolate, whatever it is you fancy, and you join me in this very special lesson.